please, dear saints, from your Bibles this evening to the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2 in the first place and chapter 10 in the second place, reading two portions from these two chapters. We read these passages in connection with the first commandment in which God says to us, you shall have no other gods before me. chapter 1 of Jeremiah, we read of God's commissioning Jeremiah to be God's prophet, to speak to wayward people of Judah, and we hear that word here in Jeremiah chapter 2, where he says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in the land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the claims of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me, went after the worthlessness and became idle and became worthless? They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt to let us in the wilderness, in the land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through where no man dwells? And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and good things. But when you came in, you defiled the land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, I will contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children's children, I will contend. For cross to the coast of Cyprus and see, or send a cater and examine with care. See if there's ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Let's turn also to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah 10, verses 1 through 17. This, too, is God's holy word. Jeremiah says, hear the word that the Lord speaks to a house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the peoples are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with a hammer and nail so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot even speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is in them to do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations, and in all their kingdoms... There is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of idols is but wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. They are the work of the craftsmen and the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes, and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus shall you say to them, The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth, from under the heavens. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he makes the mist rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from his storehouses. 
Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols. For his images are false and there is no breath in them. They are worthless, a work of delusion. At the time of their punishment, they shall perish. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob. For he is the one who formed all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance, the Lord of hosts is his name. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our Lord stands forever. This turn also the Heidelberg Catechism. It should be on the back page of your bulletin inserts. Come to Lord's Day 2034 this evening. Lord's Day 34 has four questions and answers. The first simply asks, what is God's law? And it gives us the law from Exodus 20. And then it asks us, how are the commandments divided? And we confess there into two tables. The first has four commandments, teaching us how we should live in relation to God. And the second has six, teaching us that we owe our neighbor. And then we read question and answers 94 and 95 together, responsibly of the congregation. Congregation, what does the Lord require in the first commandment? That I, not wanting to endanger my own salvation, avoid and shun all idolatry, sorcery, superstitious rites, and prayer to saints or to other creatures. That I rightly know the only true God, trust Him alone, and look to God for every good thing, humbly and patiently, and love, fear, and honor Him with all my heart. In short, that I renounce all created things rather than go against God's will in any way. And then question 95, what is idolatry? Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed himself in his word. This the Church of Christ does believe and confess. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, this evening we begin our study of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, of course, are a summary, a comprehensive summary of God's will for humanity. They are binding on every human being who has ever walked the face of the earth, and they are the basis, the standard on which God will judge every human being who has ever walked on the face of the earth. But as you all know, these commandments came to Israel in a context. These commandments were given in a unique moment in redemptive history. These commandments, oftentimes referred to as the ten words of the covenant, were given to Israel after they were brought out of the house of Egypt, the land of slavery, and prior to their going into the promised land. And it's important to recognize that because in so doing we are reminded that God's deliverance was not conditioned on Israel's obedience. God's delivering them was not conditioned on their law-keeping, but rather God's deliverance of of Israel out of Egypt was entirely grounded in his grace and his desire to save. And God did save, didn't he? With an outstretched arm, God involved himself in the life of the people of Israel. He sent plagues over Egypt. He delivered them from the hand of the tyrannical Pharaoh. And he brought them safely to the waters of the Red Sea. And then after he renewed his covenant, Exodus 19, after he redefined Israel, reconstituted Israel as a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, then and only then did God give them his law. He gave them his law to be a roadmap, as it were, on their way out of the wilderness and into the promised land. And this is how God's law is to function in our lives as well. The Ten Commandments, after all, do serve to remind us, don't they, that this world is not our home. The Ten Commandments remind us that although we find ourselves living here on this earthly colony, our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to the kingdom of heaven. And so we live by a different set of rules than the world lives by. And we have a different way of life than the world. And that way of life is the way of obedience. This unique way of life is the way of obedience to God's law. As we've heard in the last couple of Lord's Days, as you and I are sanctified by the Spirit of Christ, we learn to walk in newness of life. We 
learn to put to death that old man with all his desires and to put on the new man, which is after Christ, and goodness, righteousness, and holiness. For those who love God, keep his commandments. As Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. As our catechism teaches us, boys and girls, these commandments are divided into two parts or two tables. The, the first table dealing with how we are to love God, commandments 1 through 4, and the second, how we are to love our neighbor, commandments 5 through 10. And there's an important reason for that, the reason being that you and I can only get the, the horizontal right, how we are to, to love our neighbor if we get the vertical right, how we are to love God above all else. And learning how we are to relate to God begins with the first commandment, that we should have no other gods before the Lord. This commandment is given to us first because this commandment is the most important commandment that there is. As one pastor described, if you think of the Ten Commandments as a, as a ten-story building, then the first commandment is ground level. If, if the first level collapses, then the whole building comes crashing down. And we see that all around us in our world today, don't we? The, the inconsistencies of, of people trying to figure out how, how to love neighbor without loving God. And so we live in a society where we, we love our neighbor by, by hating racism, for example, all the while allowing for the murder of the unborn on the other. The commandments don't hold together apart from keeping the first commandment to love the Lord and to have no other gods before him. And so one of the things we discover here in Lord's Day 34 is that when we break any one of the commandments, we are always breaking the first commandment. Because what the first commandment requires of us is a wholehearted commitment to love God more than anything else or anybody else. And this is why the first commandment continues to be so relevant in our world today. While we may not see so many idols carved out of wood anymore, certainly misguided and wrong place commitments are all around us. And so God has included this commandment as the first commandment in his roadmap because idolatry confronts us at every possible turn along the journey. From the moment you wake up tomorrow to the moment you go to sleep, you will be challenged with regard to what are your heart's commitments. The choices that you make throughout the day will be determined by by what is most precious to your heart. We heard this morning that the Christian can have confidence in every circumstance if his confidence is in the Lord, but, but tomorrow you will be tempted to place your confidence elsewhere. You'll be tempted to to confide in other things, to confide in things of the world and the flesh to find comfort and satisfaction. Your dreams and your aspirations will reveal where your allegiances lie, whether they be to King Jesus or to King Self. And so the first plant we come to see really demands everything of us. It it demands that we dedicate all that we have and, and all that we are to all that God is. It leaves no wiggle room for for half-heartedness. But it requires our wholehearted devotion, wholehearted loyalty to the Lord. The first commandment beckons us to to renounce all idolatry, every idol, and, and to confess with Jeremiah, Lord, there is none like you. To confess with Jeremiah, why why would the nation serve anyone else when you're the king of the nations? To say with Jeremiah, Lord, this is your due. Among all the nations of the world, there is none like you. As we work our way through this, Lord, we want to note three things together this evening. First of all, the first man that calls us to listen to the Lord as God alone. It calls us in the second place to look to the Lord as God alone. And finally, the first man that calls us, it summons us to love the Lord as God alone. Boys and girls, when the Lord says, you shall have no other gods before me, he's not suggesting that there actually are other gods. There aren't. And he's not merely saying, if you're going to have other gods, just make sure that I'm ranked above all the rest. But rather what God is saying, you shall have no other gods in my presence. You shall have no other gods before my face. And we, of course, know that everything we think, do, and say is before God's face, we always live quorum Deo, before the face of God. 
And so in the first commandment, God is calling us to stand before him and to stand in awe of him. And to give him his rightful due, which is our whole heart. This command, of course, is placed upon every human creature who has ever walked the face of the earth. And yet, in the prologue of the Ten Commandments, we understand that this commandment comes to us in the wake, in the aftermath of God's grace. When God says to Israel, you shall have no other gods before me, he's reminding them that they've just now been redeemed out of a world of worthless idols. Egypt, of course, was, was full of idols, of false gods who could not save. In fact, when you study Egypt's mythology, one of the things you'll discover is that, that each of the ten plagues were, were signs showing that God was mighty in all the false gods of Egypt. God was proving himself to be true and all the gods of Egypt to be false. And so when God caused the Nile to be turned into blood, he was showing that Hopi, the god of the Nile, was a false god. When he sent boils upon the people of Egypt, he was showing that, that Isis, the god of medicine and peace, was no real god at all. When he caused darkness to cover the land of Egypt for three days, he was showing them that Ra is also a false god. And so it was with, with, each, with each, each of the Ten Commandments. God was proving himself to be true and the idols to be false. God was proving himself to be true and the idols to be false because... He loved the people of Israel. And now as Israel is about to begin her journey to the land of Canaan, a land full of idols, God, knowing how, how easily the heart of man is, is led astray by sinful affections, God says, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do what the, what the Gentiles are doing. You shall have no other gods before me. For I am the Lord. I am your covenant God, your redeemer and friend. I'm the God who, who brought you out with an outstretched arm, out of the house of bondage. This commandment is predicated on God's grace. And so when our catechism asks us what God requires of us in the first commandment, we answer by saying that I avoid and shun all idolatry. That I avoid and shun all sorcery and superstitious rites and prayer to the saints and, and any other creature. And the Catechism defines more narrowly what idolatry is. Idolatry is, is inventing or having anything which we would place alongside of God or in place of God to place our trust. It's a pretty comprehensive definition. It doesn't leave us with much wiggle room. But rather, as we live in this world and not of and as we're surrounded by so many different voices, voices that, that call out to us, that, that call out to us to, to flirt with the temptations of the world. The first thing that reminds us that we are to listen to one voice. The roadmap directs us to listen to one voice, the voice of the Lord as God alone. And yet like Judah, we're all so prone to forget that, aren't we? We too commit those two evils. We forsake the Lord, the fountain of living waters, and we dig for ourselves broken cisterns, cisterns that can hold no water. We too often find ourselves running from the very things that God says we should be shunning. And yet God graciously comes to us, he came to Judah, he awakens our seared and sleepy consciences by asking the question, what, what fault did your fathers find in me that they went so far from me? He appeals to their own experience. What, what, what fault did you find in me when I brought you out of Egypt? What fault did you find from me when I sent you manna from heaven? God comes to Judah and to Oz and Jeremiah 10 and graciously contends with us saying, Learn not the way of the nations. Don't be dismayed at the signs of the heavens because the nations are dismayed at them, for the customs of the peoples are vanity. Do you recognize that this evening? That the customs of the world are vanity, futility, foolishness, meaninglessness. The tree is from the forest is cut down and worked with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fast it with nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field, and they cannot even speak. 
They have to be carried because they came at wash. What vanity, what meaninglessness. And yet in her sin and hardness of heart, Judah forsook the Lord for these worthless, futile idols. Rather than seeking to know God more, to, to acknowledge him alone as the Lord of their lives, they turned their hearts to the folly of dumb idols, thinking that life and happiness could be found in them. And this is the condition of the heart of man, isn't it? The Apostle Paul picks up on this in Romans 1 when he says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for what? For images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Boys and girls, can you imagine the people of Judah bowing down Worshipping idols carved out of stone and painted with gold. We don't see a lot of that in our world today, do we? But it certainly does exist. I can remember when I was in high school going on a comparative religions field trip. We went to a Hindu temple and there in this temple there were all these life-size, lifeless idols. With their hands like this and in their hands, money. They'll put their trust in them, thinking they could save. A few years ago, I went to the cathedral in Notre Dame, and there too saw something similar. Men and women on their knees, praying to pictures of Mary, as though she could hear anything they say. And yet, while we may not see a whole lot of idolatry like this anymore, the apostles' warning still stands, because... We make gods out of all sorts of things, don't we? We can make gods out of sex. We can make gods out of success. We can make gods out of food. We can make gods out of fitness. And so as one pastor writes in this passage, before laughing at the Israelites for bowing down before blocks of wood, you feel the tug of idolatry on your own heart. Consider how attractive the idols of this age often seem. Consider the appeal of rich desserts or the satisfaction of managing the lives of others or the allure of sexual pleasure or the comfort of being well-liked or the exhilaration of making it to the top of your profession or the relaxation of a luxurious vacation. We discover in Jeremiah chapter 10 that idols are attractive. Why do idols attract us? Well, for one reason, idols attract us because they appear to be beautiful. They give us something tangible to see with our eyes, right? They're, they're overlaid with gold and silver, as it was in the Old Testament. They're, they're packaged for us so neatly. So they're so desirable to our eyes. We can see it, feel it, touch it. Idols also attract because when it comes to idolatry, there's also a, a real sense of, well, everyone else is doing it. There's a peer pressure involved. God identifies that too in verse 3, that, that the customs of the peoples are vain, but it is the custom of the peoples. Everyone else is doing it. Everyone else is, is trying to climb their way to the top of the ladder, stomping on heads to get up there. Why can't I do that? But at the end of the day, the most fundamental reason for why idols attract is because, as John Calvin said, the heart of man is an idol factory. Human beings are wired for worship. God designed us in such a way, says one pastor, that we have to give our hearts to someone or something. Humans are devotional beings. But in their sin, and their sense of sin, their sense of direction, devotion has become warped and misdirected such that the human heart is is bent on turning away from the Lord, on turning away from the sound of his voice. We're surrounded by so many voices, so many idols, each one calling us to to temporary satisfaction that leads only to destruction. And this is why we ought to be exceedingly thankful today that God has not left us in that sin and misery, that God has not left us in our idolatry. Because that idolatry only ever leads to disappointment and death. 
certainly did for the armies of Egypt, right? As they all drowned in the Red Sea. By his spirit, God grants us the grace to rightly know him and to listen to the sound of his voice, which, which warns us that every idol is one day going to perish from the earth. Jeremiah writes that in verse 11 of chapter 10. He writes it in, in Aramaic, not in Hebrew as is customary, because he's writing to make it clear to the whole ancient world. God's judgment coming to a city near you if you believe in idols. All the idols of the world will perish. And God is gracious to warn us with that word. And so we ask this, ourselves the question, why would we listen to anyone else? This is his due. There is none like him. In the first we met, God summons us to trust him alone and to look to him for every good thing, humbly and patiently. Does this describe you tonight, people of God? Can you say tonight that you're trusting in God alone, that you're humbly and patiently looking to him for every good thing? What idols have you erected in your heart that need to be toppled over? If you need help identifying them, one pastor suggests asking yourselves questions like these. What things take the place of God in your life? Where do you find your significance and your confidence? What things make you really angry? Since anger usually erupts when an idol gets knocked off the shelf. Congregation, as you picture these idols in your mind, do you see them for what they really are? Do you see that they're like scarecrows in a field, powerless, false, and worthless? All the idols of this world, all the idols that we place in the shelves of our hearts, they're all unstable and not sturdy. They're all easily shaken and easily moved. Verse 4 of chapter 10, they can't dress themselves. No, you have to do that. They can't stand by themselves. No, they need to be propped up and fastened to a wall with a hammer and nails because when the ground shakes, they topple over otherwise. You can't lean on them. You can't trust in them. They can't uphold you. They fail you every time. They're all broken cisterns that can hold no water, says Jeremiah. But if you place your trust in the Lord and look to him for every good thing, then you'll discover that he is the fountain of living water. Tell you tonight, dear saints, there's no one else like him in all the world. This is your due, says Jeremiah. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due, for among all the wise ones of the nations and all their kingdoms, there is none like you. The gods who did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth from under the heavens. For it is God who made the earth by his power. It's God who established the world by his wisdom, by his understanding, stretched out the heavens. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens. He makes the mist to rise from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings forth the wind from its storehouses. Every man is stupid and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols, for his images are false, and there is no breath in them. Notice the contrast that Jeremiah is making for us. Idols are false, but the Lord is true. Idols are dead, but God is alive. Idols are breathless, but God breathes life. Idols fade and perish, but God is the everlasting God. From the beginning of the world to the end thereof, God is God, and in him there is no shadow of turning which means he can be trusted, which means he can be leaned on. He's not going to fall over. He's not going to let you down. And his desire for you and me tonight, dear saints, is that we should see and believe that, that we should live that. His desire is that we should trust him and look to him for every good thing, since as we confess in Article 1 of our Belgian Confession, he is good in the overflowing fountain of all good. 
This is who God has revealed himself to be in his word. The fountain of living waters, worthy of praise, worthy of your devotion. We consider that lastly tonight, that in the first commandment, God summons us to love, fear, and honor him with all our heart. And the Lord Jesus was asked which was the greatest commandment. Even our boys and girls can tell us that Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And what Jesus meant by that was to say, you, you can't love God without your heart. You can't love him only half-heartedly. But you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. With wholehearted devotion, you shall love him and serve him and live for him. God is after our hearts tonight. That's what he was after in the days of Jeremiah, and that's what God is after this evening. When God spoke to Judah through Jeremiah in chapter 2, he began by saying, I, I remember the devotion of your youth, how you loved me as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. There was a time when Judah loved the Lord as a bride loves her husband. There was a time when Judah followed the Lord. In that land between redemption and crossing over the river Jordan. And that's what God is now calling her to turn back. To turn her heart back to the Lord her God. To love him with everything she has. To give him 100% of her heart's loyalty. Appearing just under a thousand times the word heart is used in the Bible more than any other word to, to describe our inner selves. Throughout the Bible, the, the spotlight is often cast on our hearts because the heart plays such a crucial role in shaping our desires and shaping our affections. The Lord Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Lord Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But of course, we know our hearts are prone to wonder. We all feel that. We all know what that's like. But as J.C. Ryle once wrote, there is nothing in our heart that the Lord of our heart cannot make right. As our chief prophet Christ speaks into our hearts. And he reorients our hearts to listen to the Lord's voice. As our only high priest Christ cleanses our hearts of all of their impurities, all their impure affections. And gives us new affections. Stronger affections. As our eternal king, Christ, rules our hearts. He rules our hearts by his spirit, giving us new wills to do the very thing the first commandment calls us to do, to love, fear, and honor God with all our heart, to, to renounce all created things rather than go against God's will in any way. You see, in his grace, it's not simply that God he eradicates all the desires of our hearts. Or that he simply changes us into desireless beings. But rather in the gospel, God gives us new and stronger desires. Such that our knowledge and, as our knowledge and love of him grows deeper and deeper, the voices and vices of the world become less and less enticing. I was reminded of the sirens from the stories of Greek mythology. As some of you may know, the the sirens used their mesmerizing song to, to lure sailors to their death, to the, to the rocky shore, each one failing. Only two famous Greeks were able to sail by these luring sirens. The first one's Odysseus. As Odysseus drew near the place where the sirens sang their song, he, he stopped the ears of his men with wax so that they couldn't hear him. And he had them tie him to the mast of the ships so that he could hear them, but that they couldn't hear him directing them to go towards their sound. He was clever, but not honorable. The other successful sailor was the legendary Orpheus, the greatest of all the Greek poets and music musicians. As his friend Argonauts approached the sirens, began to steer the ship towards their direction. Noble Orpheus took out his lyre and began to sing an even sweeter song. And his song was so beautiful that it drowned out the noise of the sirens such that Argonauts was able to steer the ship away from destruction and back in the right direction. And this is how God wins our hearts back to him in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes to us, he doesn't make the cold demand to, to stop our ears with wax so we can't hear anything or anybody anymore. 
but rather God in Christ sings a sweeter song. And as we give our ears to the sound of his voice, our love for the idols of the world and their attraction diminishes as our love for him deepens. Speaking negatively, God comes to us in the first commandment and says, you shall have no other gods before me. If that's what he says negatively, then what is God saying to us positively? Positively, what God is saying is this, rather than having other gods, you shall have me. God, in his grace, invites us to have and to hold him. Listen again to the words of Jeremiah in verses 15 and 16 of chapter 10. The idols of men are worthless. A work of delusion at their time they shall perish. Not like these is he who is the portion of Jacob. For he is the one who formed all things. And Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Jeremiah proclaims to wayward Judah, and by the Spirit of Christ, he proclaims to us our own sense of of emptiness and misdirection. He says, don't you know that the Lord himself is your portion? Don't you know that you are his inheritance? That in Christ you can say, I am his and he is mine. This is what the first commandment summons us to recognize, people of God. That we're only called to love the one who loved us first. That we're only called to serve the one who served us first in the sending of his son. We're called to be loyal to the one who has never for a moment stopped being loyal to us. But so loyal was he that he gave his own dear son to be forsaken at the cross. To be loyal to the word that he gave to Abram. I will be your God and you'll be my people. Do you love the Lord tonight? Is he your strength when you are weak? Is he the treasure that you seek? Is he your all in all? Congregation, how can he not be? How can you not love him? How can you not say with Jeremiah, there is none like you, O Lord. You are great and your name is great and might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? This is your due, for among all the wise ones of the nations and all their kingdoms, there is none like you. There's many things in this life that demand your attention and praise, some of them more worthy than others. But no one is so worthy of your heart. No one is so worthy of your devotion. No one is so worthy of your time and your energy as the Lord. So let us learn to say with King David, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh, my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank that in your grace you are a God who contends with us who beseeches us, who comes to us in our sin and misery, that you awaken our seared and silent consciences, and you point us back to your grace, that you ask us again and again, what fault have you found in me, that you should turn away from me? That you warn us again and again, that we should not forsake the fountain of living waters, we should not dig for ourselves cisterns that can hold no water. Lord, we thank you for these warning signs along the way to the new promised land. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a road map. You have not left us as orphans to know, to not know how we ought to serve you and live for you aright. We thank you that you're a God that we can lean on, that you won't fall over, that you don't need to be held up with hammer and nails, but that you speak, that you can walk, By the voice of your mouth, you created the world, and by your voice again, you caused us to hear the word of Christ. We might knock over every idol on the shelf of our hearts. 
Father, grant us grace to do that, to, to shun the voices of the world, to run away from them, and to give our ears to the sweeter song that only Jesus can sing. Father, cause us to confess with Jeremiah, there is none like you in all the world. And may the peoples of this world who live in vanity, may they see that in us, in our lives, that we serve a God who is unique, who is reliable, who is a great king of the nations. Lord, teach us to say with the psalmist, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth we desire more than you. Teach us to say with the psalmist that our flesh and heart may fail, but you are our strength and that you are our portion forever. May these words be our own until we see Christ face to face. We ask it in his name and for his sake. Amen.